so this is lecture 26 of 23, uh, uh, sorry. We're going to look at in this lecture. So in the last lecture, in lecture 25, what we saw was how we split a transmit and receive filter. Like so, so let's say we want the overall response, transmitter, receiver, and channel, the overall have a Nyquist response. We saw how we can design a transmit filter and a receive filter for a given in order to achieve that. We have the premise that when we have the end-to-end -end overall response of the transmission system, that it is Nyquist and we tolerate zero. We're going to change our perspective a little bit. Now the is suppose we say I can it's going to be a small performance penalty, but this will give us a lot more flexibility to design the system, the end-to-end -end response that will achieve not zero ISI, but will give one ISI term to the ISI gods will let everything else be equal to zero. That's the goal, okay? So, this is all based on something called Lender's Criterion. And Lender's Criterion says, let there only be one ISI term, right? And that this term, it's going to be introduced in the transmitter for, and compensated for in the receiver. This compensation is not ideal, and we will accept some sort of EB over and not hit some penalty. Okay? Ah, okay. So what this means is, remember before, so let's, let's go do, let's do some doodling, okay? Remember before, we had the following. We had the situation where we had 0T, 2T, 3T, Okay. And we had per precursor and postcursor ISI. So remember that? So what happens, we have the desired sample. Something like this. Right? Okay. And what happens is this is some sort of response. So this is H of 0. That's what? H of 1? Correct? That's H of 2. That's H of 3, so this is the, what, precursor, postcursor. And this guy here is H of minus 1, H of minus 2, H of minus 3, dot, 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 and that's the precursor ISI. Okay? But if I design it correctly, at the sampling instances, I have zero crossings, but we saw what, ha what happened, right? We have, if we try and use sync pulses, we have a law of ISI sensitivity. And with the raised cosine pulses, we don't have that ISI sensitivity. Now what I'm saying is the following. Suppose now I have 3T, 2T, T, 0, minus T, minus 2T, minus 3T. And now I say, okay, I can tolerate something here and maybe something there. Much nicer. Because now what happens is, so let's suppose I have h of 0 and I have the h of 1 and everything else is a 0 crossing. Look how much wider that lobe is. Right? What we'll find is that this is way less sensitive to ISI. Because what happens is what I've just done is I've sort of widened the bandwidth, right? Of, or in this case, duration, but we'll see what happens in the frequency domain. What happens is because we now are trained to this absolutely needs to be one and everything else has to be zero, now it's like, don't worry about it. This and this can tolerate a non-zero contribution of like the desired in the first ISI term and everything else has to be zero crossing. This turns out that it will give us some flexibility in designing 
um, a variety of different communication systems. So the first of which is duo binary signaling. And then what we'll talk about is precoding. Okay? So let's let's look at that. So what happens is remember what I just said. The desired instant at zero n equals zero is going to be the desired point. Plus we're going to have a non zero contribution of ISI from, let's say, H1. And that will be I and mi minus 1, okay? Uh, I minus n, yeah, that's true. Everything else, though, should be 0. So what, what are we doing? So basically, I'm saying, okay, let's allow ISI, but it's controlled. It's under my terms. And so I know exactly what it should be, the contribution, and that will give me some more flexibility to design my system. So when we write it out, what we have is the following. When we sample at KT, the zero crossings with the exception of H of T, so H1, there's going to be an ISI term from that, and there's going to be desired symbol. So what we have now is we have IK and we have IK minus 1. So this actually comes up with a very interesting scenario. So let's look at this. Let's look at this. Oh, yeah, this is so cool. Okay. <laughs> So what we get is the following. So let's look at this guy. Just like my phone. Ah, erase. Okay. So think about it. So let's say I sample some symbol. So at some time instant nt. Okay. And so what I'm going to have is it NT or a KT? I think it was KT, but whatever. So let's say we have N, right? And we're going to have H naught. Plus, we're going to have N minus 1. So the previous symbol, and we're going to have H1, right? So now what happens is we have this very interesting scenario. What ends up happening is, um, if we, if, like, you know, before, if it was the des desired symbol, we either decode, like, so let's say eight, um, I of n can either be 1 or 0. Now what we have is it's either 1 plus this guy here, whatever the previous n is, h1, or 0 plus this guy, right? Now, let, it gets interesting. These guys here can be 1 or 0 as well, right? And there's a very interesting case. So let's suppose we do the following scenario with the controlled ISI concept. So let's say that's 0, that's t, that's minus t, that's minus 2t, that's 2t. And we have essentially c and c. They're both identical. The ISI term is just as high as the desired term. So then I have, woo, right? So now, if we do that, what do we have? 1 plus C I N minus 1. And in fact, we also have a C here. So, so it's C and then C plus I N minus 1. No, sorry, that's, uh, sorry. Ooh, 0. Okay. But it's more complicated than that. Because what ends up happening is this guy here can be a 1 or a 0. And this guy here, the same thing, can be a 1 or a 0. Right? So what, what ends up happening, in fact, is um, our y n of t can be what? 2c. Actually... Uh, I take that back. Shoot. Next time we're going to get more sleep, guys. <laughs> Just kidding. Sleep is overrated. Um, and then that's minus C. So that's going to be minus 2, and this guy is going to be 0. What we have is we have three possible values. What's very interesting to is that this sort of controlled ISI concept what gives us something like uh, some sort of tertiary modulation scheme. So 
um, if let's say the previous and the current symbol are both the same value, you either have a 2c or a minus 2c. And then it's the middle guy. This is the scary part. The middle guy could either be minus 1 plus 1 or plus 1 minus 1. And that's where it gets sticky. So what you need to do is almost, that's where pre-coding comes in. What happens is we use in order to say, okay, so the, the, the previous, like, so it's kind of like a differential coding, if you will. And what we look at is sort of the string of the differentially encoded transmission in order to sort of fill in the gap. So let's say we have this case of zero. So it either is a plus, minus, or minus, plus. But before that, it was a minus 2c. So what is that? Oh, so the guy that's feeding into that zero, the, first, the previous symbol is a minus c. That means the other guy minus c. So you see, now what happens is the information symbols are not in one builds on the other, builds on the other, builds on the other. Right? So what do I mean to say? Okay, well, let, let, me, let me explain. So let's say we have something like this. So let's say I get outputs of 2c, 2c, 0, minus 2c, 0, 2c. So what does that mean? So I know that the previous symbol is a plus 1, plus 1 for this guy, right? And then this guy here is going to be the previous guy, and it's going to be someone. It's going to be plus 1. Oh, the 0 here is this guy. The only way I can get that is he's a minus 1. And then this guy here, well, he has to be a minus 1. Oh, 0 here, that means he has to be a plus 1. Oh. This guy's a 2c, well, he has to be a plus 1 as well. So what I've just done is through this dual binary type of scheme, what I can do is, so I have these three levels, and means unchanged, constantly positive, unchanged, constantly negative, and zero is there's a transition happening. And the key is, where is it transitioning to, and where is it transitioning from, right? Of course, this makes it very scary, because what happens if I have an error? You know? What happens if I miscalculate and it's like, shoot, like let's say for some weird oddball reason, it's not zero. Let's say the next guy, this guy, let's say all of a sudden I decode him as like minus C for some oddball reason. Let's say there are going to be thresholds here. The thresholds are plus C and minus C, right? And let's say for some reason it gets decoded as minus C. It makes no sense. And then, ah, now there's an error, and we can detect those things, right? But let's go back to this. Exactly. So, 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 uh, so, so the question is, is, or the statement, the assertion is, this is like a convolutional code. And, and the answer is, we're, what we're doing, just like in coding, is we're spreading the information temporally. So now there's correlation amongst information bits. Absolutely right. And so the question now is, what is that H of T? So we saw before, what we saw before, is the following. We saw that one H of T okay, looks like this. Right? So now, the, the question is, suppose I have something And I know that this guy here has to be C. This guy here has to be C. He's supposed to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. 
Oh, it's sampled, right? So what did we learn in digital signal processing in order to get an analog waveform from discrete samples? Use sync pulse, right? So what, what happens is if you do this ideally, what you do is you take every one of those guys, every one of those samples, and you superimpose a sync pulse and you sort of add them all together, right? In order to reconstruct, like, you know, assuming it's band limited, that's, that's, the, that's the caveat. Remember from Nyquist, and, uh, I mean from DSP, um, in order to recover, so, um, blah. So, so essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, recover the continuous time domain um, response from these discrete samples. So what you do, and this is done over here, from sampling theory, so if you have these discrete samples, and if, let's say, you know that that filter, filtering response is band limited according to, let's say, this constraint here, all you do is you take each one of those samples, you have some sort of sync pulse with finite bandwidth, this 2W, two, two they're all time shifted, you multiply them by those samples and you add them together, right? So you reconstruct what the continuous time waveform is like. But that's ideal, right? In real life, does that work? Because you have to truncate the sync pulses, so it doesn't really work out. But in theory, this is how you would reconstruct it, right? And so what you is if you have, let's say, that bandwidth, and then let's say what's the frequency response of this guy. So, so first of all, what's the, what is the Fourier transform uh, or frequency representation of a sync pulse? It's a rectangular pulse with bandwidth 2W. And so that's why we have this guy here. Like, let's go down here. So we have the Fourier transform of the sync. What happens is, what is a time domain shift? It is going to be equal to uh, uh, it's going to be equal to e to the minus j two pi f n t, and and then you have the Fourier transform of the sync pulse, and we know what that's going to be equal to, and we have h n of t. What's the Fourier transform of h n of t? Nothing, because it's not a function of little t. So what ends up happening is what we're really doing is we're taking the Fourier transform. So first of all, Fourier transform. Is it a linear operation? Yes, right? Summation, linear. So we can interchange, we can take the Fourier transform of this entire summation, or we can take the summation of the individual Fourier transform of every term. The H n of t is a constant for all intents and purposes. The sync pulses that are time delayed, we take each one of those delay elements, they're gonna be an exponential factor. And then we take the uh, Fourier transform of the sync pulses, that's gonna be a rectangular wave across two W. And so what we get at the end of the day is this thing here. So that's how we create H of F. So, so, in, so this is more of an aside. If you want to create the continuous time frequency response, this is how you would do it. From DSP theory, you'd use, you would basically take each sample, multiply it by this specific band-limited waveform in the frequency domain by 2W, uh, 2 and you would multiply it with every H and add up all the H's, multiply with these things together in order to get your response. Now, if we go one step further to what I call the duo binary case, which we just saw, and given this response, so now we know what this guy is equal to, okay? Suppose that we know, uh, the reason why we did the aside is we, we h of 0 and h of t are non-zero and everything else is zero. So what does that give us? So let's, let's write this on the whiteboard. And I hope I can remember because it's a, you know, a lot of complicated math. No, just kidding. Hmm. So what happens is, what do we see? So h of f is equal to, so it's zero. And other and and okay, and minus infinity to infinity. Okay, okay. 
and then that's uh, is it H? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Somehow my memory is really bad today. Must be the old age. Okay, and then this guy is what? E to the minus J, and I forgot the rest of the exponent. I am so bad today. Min uh, so n pi f over w. n pi pi f over w. Okay, and so this is for what? So the bandwidth zero to one over two t. Okay. And otherwise, it's zero. Now, remember what I mentioned about the du dual binary case. Okay? Which is for H0 and H1, both the, those guys are going to be equal to C, and everything else, otherwise, HN is equal to zero. So if we take this guy, the aside, and now apply him, what do we get? 1 over 2 pi. So the first term is going to be, eight, uh, so, so nt is 0. It's a zeroth case. And so the exponent 0, so basically this guy is going to be equal to h naught. The second guy, right, is going to be equal to h of t, correct? Um, e to the minus j pi f of w. And otherwise, it's going to be equal to 0. So what you end up having now is this h naught term and this ht term. What do we know about h naught? C. What do we know about h of t? C. C. So what this gives us is the following. That means our h of f is going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi, and then it's going to be, and we can take the c out, 1 plus e to the j pi uh, f over w, right? For 0 f 1 over 2 t, which is w, and otherwise. Okay, so now we have that, we can actually manipulate this. We can actually split the exponent here. We can, we can actually sort of divide it by half of that on both sides. And what we'll get is, by Euler's relation, we have a cosine. So we can actually do that. So when we do that, okay, in this guy case, so what we get is him and zero otherwise. And, and so what happens is this h of f, now we need to find the, in, the, find the inverse Fourier transform of him in order to find out what h of t is. So the purpose of this is to create that overall dual binary response. And so it turns out that this guy here, okay, so what we do is let's work backwards. So let's use the ideal sort of recovery of the um, of our um, continuous time response h of t from h of n, so we use sync pulses. So we sum these guys together, and we have this here in order to get this response, just like what I mentioned before. And so what ends up happening is so so we have this in the time domain, we get that sort of response, or alternatively. If you take the inverse Fourier transform of that, you should get the same thing. Okay? But the thing I'm really interested in is finding out what is the probability of error. Right? So we can play around with DSP, but that's another course. Or what we can do is what is the probability of error? And so this diagram here is kind of interesting. So I'm just going to cut to the chase.
So what happens is, so suppose that's 2c, suppose that's minus 2c, and that's 0, that's c, and that's minus c. And we have, that's our decision threshold, that's our decision threshold, right? So we saw what happens. Um, anything that we get here is going to be decoded as, um, you know, i n was equal to 1, i n minus 1 is equal to 1. Uh, this guy here, i n is equal to minus 1, i n minus 1 is equal to minus 1. And this guy, i n, is equal to plus or minus 1, and i n minus 1 is equal to minus or plus 1. It's, it's one or the other and the other and 1. Yeah, that makes total sense. But he, so here's the thing. What is the impact of noise on all of this? Any thoughts? It's going to nudge it down, right? So let's say we have Gaussian noise, right? So let's say I transmit this dual binary signal, and it's at 0, right? What would be the impact of Gaussian noise on that? So let's say, I can't draw out of the screen, but let's say this guy here represents the PDF. So that's the Gaussian, right? So the noise, usually if there is very small, we don't deviate so much from the actual value. Just like with these two guys here, right? If there's noise centered at 2, C, what we're going to have is something that looks like, like that. And then here at minus 2C, something like that, right? So what would be the probability, okay, that we, cor like, let's say, um, even with noise, that we remain in that, um, like, let's say if I transmit an IN and IN minus 1 that results in a 0, that I remain in the corresponding decision region. So we have three decision regions. One, two, three. So another way of asking is, what would be the probability of error that I leave um, decision region number two? And the answer is, if you have that Gaussian, it's the area under the curve, right? So what you do is you have to integrate both tail probabilities of that Gaussian. Now, what is the probability of me not getting 2C? Let's say it goes south. It would be this probability, the tail there. That so basically, every one of these Gaussians, the part of the Gaussian that goes that is the punchline behind probability of error for dual binary. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. And this is how. Because it's always a little bit more complicated. Okay? So, so you have no transition, no transition, and then here you obviously have a transition. So you have these three levels, right? So let's, let's jump into this idea of the pre-coding. And as, as what Neil mentioned, it's somewhat similar to some sort of channel coding. You're smearing, you're sharing information. There's a dependency on previous information bits and future information bits in terms of some of the information of what you're transmitting is also contained in past and future. And so the pre-coder, the way it works, you have a binary source. And then what you do okay, is essentially uh, what you do is you have this guy here. So you take the previous symbol, bk minus 1, and then you do an, um, um, an ex ex XOR of the current symbol to give you the new bk. And then what you do is, because this is binary, right? This is ones and zeros. You then have to offset it to make it one or one, plus 1 or minus 1. And that's what this unit is here. And then you put it through its um, impulse modulation. So what this guy is doing here, um, this stage, so impulse mod we saw, binary source we saw, but everything in between, 
what we're doing is that we're now creating that dependency between previous and current samples, right? And then we're sending it into the impulse mod, which now creates a delta train, and then flushing it out through a pulse shaping filter. So what happens is now we look at this guy and we say, okay, so let's look at the scenario. So let's say if the input is a zero, what is the, ex like when we, when we combine a zero with the previous symbol, there's no change. So this is, so this pre is a little bit different than the uh, dual binary that we just saw. So we're jumping to something a little bit different. So we have the no IS, we have the controlled ISI. This is slightly different because what we're doing is we're doing differential encoding. So what happens is if it's a zero, don't do anything. Keep the symbol the same. But if it's a one, change it. That's the goal, right? So if we have alpha k and we have well, whatever bk was, when we combine it, what we get is we continue transmitting bk minus 1. On the other hand, if alpha is equal to 1, well, whatever bk minus 1 is, we don't transmit it. We transmit the other scheme. Okay? So what we get is something just like what we saw with dual binary. We have three decision regions. We have a transition, and we have when things stay static. Either it continues to be minus, continues to be plus, and then the middle is to whatever it should be. So the analysis is very similar to, let's say, the dual binary case. So what happens is, let's, let's compu uh, compute what the detection of the uh, performance is like. So we have the receive signal, we have the dual, dual binary signal, and here we go back to the dual binary case, but um, uh, there we actually built it into the data as we what happens is we have the and then we have is we have RK is equal to 2C plus NK and then we also have the case of RK is equal to minus 2C plus NK. So what this is, is these are the two scenarios when everything is steady as she goes. There's no change. There's no transition. Essentially, the input, like, you know, the, the current sample is zero. So everything is the same as before. There's no transition. So the error scenario is this guy here, is when we pick up a signal, the noise pushes it into the transition region, and that is wrong. So what do we do? How do we calculate it? Essentially, it's this guy here. So, so what are these two Q functions doing here? What does this mean? Any thoughts? So the probability of error conditioned on i k equals 1 and i k minus 1 is equal 1 is equal to Q c divided by sigma minus Q 3c divided by sigma. So think about it. So what does the Q function describe? It's the tail, the tail probabilities, right? Tail from c divided by sigma onto infinity. Yes, Neil? Well, you have to take off the other side because you're, you're doing a region within Q. Mm -hmm. so that's why you have this tail minus. Exactly. So, so basically what we're doing is we're going from from some region, in this case, uh, C divided by sigma off to infinity. Oh, but wait a minute. It only extends as far as 3C over sigma. And then we're actually in the other no transition region, right? So this is. Let me draw that. I'm going to do a better job than that. What this is, we have, again, so here's our decision boundary, C minus C, right? And so what do we have? So we have, let 
and let's say, so the probability of error, right? Actually, is this correct? No, 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 no. Sorry? Exactly. So, so therefore, I am just not awake today. Okay. So it starts at 2C, right? 2C. So here's the peak of the Gaussian, and it goes off there. We don't care, because the further away, that's fine. It will get decoded as 2C. Right? Like that. And so what you want to do is you want to find what the tail probability is here. Because what happens is if we end up going all the way to minus 2C, well, that's fine too, because that gets decoded as no transition. Right? It's weird. And what happens is if we are in a state like either the top region, or it means no transition. Right? It's the middle guy that I'm worried about because that says, oh, you need to be one now if you're a plus one before. The other two guys just, the other two guys don't tell you what the exact information is. It just says, continue on as, right? So what happens is you take the tail probability, right? So in this case, it's, um, we're going negative, but let's say if we start at minus 2C, it doesn't matter. It's all symmetric. But let's say from here, it's going to minus infinity. So you just flip it around, it'll be plus infinity. So this guy, ah. <laughs> so let's say this guy is centered at, um, well, well, let's say you have C and you have 3C, right? And you only want this region here to integrate. So what do you do? What happens is you go from C all the way to infinity, and then you have 3C all the way to infinity. So you have this guy, C divided by sigma. So, that, um, so it's all this guy. And then you subtract off this tail probability that doesn't belong there in the decision-making process in order to get this area by itself. OK? Thanks. Good work. So, so that's what's drawn down here. And so if we, and we do the same also for, uh, so this is the case when both values are positive. This is when both cases are negative. And then we have the transition, and the transition's when if, we, if the noise is so bad that it pushes us into either of the no transition regions, we get an error. So that's what this is here. So if you do this, what you get is actually, it's going to be two times each tail probability because of the symmetry. And so we get this, this Q function error. And then when you add it all together, you average it out, you get this expression. Okay? Okay, so now going back to Lender's system, to Lender's criterion, right? So what we want to do now is, in addition to this um, pre-coding that we're doing, we have also the transmit and receive filters. And we are told what these filters are. So what happens is we have this sort of spread across the um, main term as well as the ISI term. And we have a filter design that is geared towards that. So we have a, a bandwidth that's basically two times the symbol, the transmission symbol bandwidth, but that's totally fine because we're doing this pre-coding that allows to have two symbols in that bandwidth, right? We're allowed that smearing across not only the desired sampling instant, but also really cool. So before and previously, the probability of error, yep. that's just like for one error, but like because they're all dependent on each other, you get like FK instead of one. Well, well, so, sort of. So what happens is what we're doing is we're trying to consider for the case of like, like every possible combination, this is the overall probability of suppose you take the current symbol and the previous symbol and you average it if it's like, let's say, is it 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, plus 1, minus 1. 
and then try and find out what the overall probability of error is in this case. So, but yeah, if you, let's say... Yeah. Yeah. So, so there. Yeah. So there. Is, well, yeah. Because now there's a dependency. So, but the only thing is. Well, no. Well, no, 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 no. Because because look what happens. So at the receiver, how do we decode this thing? So what happens is, did you notice when we did the example? So we had two C, two C, zero minus 2c, 0, 2c. Like there, between transitions, there always, has to be, um, there always has to be a 0, right? So if we ever have like a bit error or, some, or basically some sort of corruption. So the corruption is not happening at the bit level. It's happening at the sort of the symbol level, and that's what we're worried about. And that could be easily caught because later on what happens is it's going to propagate only so far, and then it's going to write itself. So let, let me actually draw that. That's a good question. So, so what happens is, remember what we did before. So let's say we had 2c, 2c, 0. So I'm intentional. Because if you think about it, minus 2c, 0, 2c. So what happens is we know that this is going to be, let's say this, this was plus 1, plus 1. Oh, this is still 2c, so there's no change. So that's plus 1. Oh, that's a 0. That's got to be minus 1. Oh, that's a minus 2c. Well, that has to be minus. Oh, it's 0. That has to be a plus. Oh, that's a, you know. And what happens is suppose now, let's say we do something like this, 2c. So what, what ends up happening? That's considered a plus, right? Then the next guy, well, that's kind of confusing, right? So, so what happens is now I have, um, OK, so now I have minus 2c. What does that mean? So no change. So yeah, so now we have a plus, And then we have now another transition. OK. Ah, uh, OK. Yeah, OK. Uh, OK. Yeah, so unless there's an average, every other bit error would realign you. So there's like, there's like some term there that would be like this duration of unalignment that would, that would be more. Yeah, until the next bit error. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing. So, so yeah. So what would happen is that's true. So the only thing is, what would be the dead giveaway is if you don't have a transition. To me, that would like you know. So if you in your receiver see, oh, I'm going from two C to minus two C, I would say there's an error right away and stop it right there and stop it from propagating. Yeah. Well, yeah, and. and well, in this case, what would happen is I would look for, if I'm going from no transition, no transition, but I know that these are sign dependent, I would say, oh, I wouldn't do that. I would do basically, there's an error happening there and write it. Yeah, well, yeah, that, yeah, so we can go through all the error states. But, <laughs> but that's what I mean, that you're going to get a probability of error penalty for doing it this way versus a strict no ISI condition. So, that, so that's the process. So you're going to put, uh, you're gonna have to put some sort of error, error detection scheme in order to look for. And yeah, if you have a double zero, then you're, you're hosed. Right. OK. Whew. OK. So now if we go through this entire end-to-end -end system, we know what the filter, the, this response is, split between transmit and receiver. We do this pre-coding business. Now what happens is if we try and find out what the is, just like before, what is the noise power that gets filtered out? So we take this guy, we take the square root of this frequency response, we then take the magnitude squared, which is equal to this frequency response, multiplied with the white noise, which has a flat PSD, and then integrate it from minus infinity to infinity, right? Or in this case, across the bandwidth of this, uh, of the, of this guy here, which is W. 
That should give us what the noise power is, and it should be equal to 2 over pi and naught. And then the uh, bit energy, well, that's the transmit waveform, magnitude squared, the, the mean squared of the information symbols multiplied against that integral, and that should give us the average bit energy. And therefore, our EB over N naught, if we plug this all in, so, so we have this guy here. We can calculate what the probability of error is okay, when we plug this all in. So we isolate for C, right, and plug him in to this guy. We know what sigma is equal to. We take that sigma term, plug it into the previous expression, and we get this guy. So what's so important about this expression that I have here? We like expressing our probability of errors as much as possible in terms of EB over n naughts, otherwise known as EBNO. Okay? And because it's at Nyquist 2, uh, since Nyquist 2 has a probability of error of this, we saw this before, what happens is what is the loss with the dual binary partial response versus Nyquist 2? It's 2.1 dB. If we take the ratio of the two, uh, 2 and take the log base 10 of it. So in the end, the bandwidth the dual binary pulse, uh, par partial response okay, is 1 over 2t, which is better than this guy. It's a narrower bandwidth, but we have a loss in terms of the probability of error of 2.1 dB. Okay? And so, okay, so that, folks, um, concludes lecture 26. Okay. Yeah, so, so like, like what Neil mentioned,